Alleluia, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When Peter saw the astonishment of those who had seen the lame man healed, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power, our piety, we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect help in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as also did your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you terrified, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. 
You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see Jesus in all his revealing works. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I hear it said relatively often, and perhaps even more lately, this statement that politics does not belong in the church, which I think is one of the most misguided, incorrect sentiments that I've ever heard. Politics, the way our society, our life together is governed, the way we honor or don't honor or raise up or resource things, that's the church's you. You are politics. It would be crazy to say there's a red line that one doesn't belong in the other and that how we make decisions as, as a society is not affected or should be separated from what we say we believe about this life and eternity. I just find that to be a very discongruous notion. Now, what I think people might be suggesting when they say that is, I don't think coming to church on Sunday is to hear kind of warmed over news commentary that I could find on any television station or in social media and to have the minister, however erudite or not, uh, tell me what I should believe in order to be a good Christian and how I should vote and what's right and what's wrong. That I think is what people are expressing and I think that's a very reasonable uh, opinion to have or thought to have. Because after all, I mean, how you think personally about gender, about reproductive rights, about climate change, about immigration, all these things is a function, I think, in my life of observation. Primarily, it starts out with where you're born, your family, uh, the influence of your parents, uh, who you're around in school as you grow up, your colleagues, how you're educated. Uh, yes, your faith plays a part of that all the way along, but I think maybe the most important influencer is your life experience. You know, how, if you have lived with someone who has a very different life experience, that sometimes gives you an open door to understanding how the other lives. Now, the church and how little time we have cannot compete with all of those various things about forming your opinion or how you choose to vote about things. I don't think we have nearly the time or the expertise to do that. But what I do think we can say is part of life, in my experience, is embracing all the complexities of our world, things you agree with, things you don't agree with, things, and making the goal of using your faith to make the world a better place in however way you experience that. And I hope your life in the church helps you ever more openly look at the world in different ways. You know, I was at a wedding a few weeks ago, you know, maybe a couple months ago, with somebody, a man I think in his 70s, who was very proudly saying, my opinions have not changed since high school. And I thought, well, I mean, I guess that could be all right, but there is a lot about our life experience that kind of it gives us different perspectives. And I hope what a principal role of your faith life is, is learning deeply from Jesus and from your growing experience of the teachings of the gospel and letting that inform your internal conversations, your familial conversations, and basically how you interact with the world. I think that is how 
faith and the public square and the political life and churches all become one part of the human existence. But for me, I mean, the few moments that you preciously honor me with your attention uh, uh, every week, I don't feel like I have any expertise to offer you about a lot of things you might choose at the ballot box. But what I feel like my principal role is to try over and over to invite you more deeply to look at that what we're doing here. Understanding, living into, perceiving the fact that what we say in the creed just about to come up, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. I mean, that is a lot to accept, live into, and fully believe on its own. And if I can help you do that, I believe it affects every other way you live in the world. And don't be shy internally if you can't fully accept that. If when we hear stories that this, this man who seemed human died, was in the grave for three days, and then start, suddenly started appearing, and then ascended to the Father, and still through the Holy Spirit informs us even of this day. I mean, that is not even all clergy, I think, fully absorb and believe that all the time. That is the work of the church, I think, to try to reflect on that mystery and let it live in you to the extent that it can. And I will tell you, my brothers and sisters, this is exactly what we hear in the gospel is going on this morning. I mean, these folks had never heard, and there isn't in, in the whole history of literature a notion of a God who allowed himself to be killed, buried, and then rose from the dead, but then wasn't quite, wasn't a ghost, was able to be touched and seen and eat food, and then ascended to the Father. I mean, this is not an experience anybody else had ever had, and I don't know that anybody has since. And so they were dealing with their own, can this be true? Am I delirious? And so Jesus, in this, remember, we're three weeks out of Easter in the liturgical year, but this gospel that you just heard is right the day after, Jesus appears to them, not as a ghost, because everybody had seen, you know, a lot of you all might have seen a ghost, or think you have, or believe maybe. They had, this isn't, he wasn't a ghost, he wasn't an apparition. He came and showed them and let them touch what felt like flesh, and then what did he do? He ate a piece of fish. This is a strange little interaction. But it's about showing that he is this unprecedented creature in history. And if we were to come to believe that he was not just our imaginations, that he has been raised from the dead, and in fact not resuscitated like Lazarus. He wasn't dead and then come back to life and then he'll die again. This is unprecedented. And it is one of the most difficult things to wrap one's mind around in all of history. That's what I think the church is about, to try to constantly give you different ways to explore and see if that will come alive in you. What, what does it matter if the God has come to earth, become victorious over dead, and has even been raised from the dead? He ate fish. Now, here's a little lamb yet, but I'm going to do something with it, so it's not just a uh, lamb yet. If you go to brunch today with some Baptists that also are using, or other uh, Protestants that are using the same lectionary, so maybe they have the same gospel today, the revised common lectionary, and they, you tell them what the gospel was, and they'll say, well, you know, what about the honeycomb? And you might say, what honeycomb? Well, in the King James translation of this text from Luke 23, it says Jesus ate a piece of boiled fish and a honeycomb. Really, look in, the, look, in, look in the King James. Have you ever, has anybody else heard the honeycomb before? A couple people. So, so, it's an interesting just uh, bit about how scripture was, it came to be. So when the King James version of the Bible was, was conceived, put together in English in the 16th century, the most authoritative version, the oldest version that they had available to them of Luke in Greek, which is where it came from when it was first written, had that phrase, and a piece of honeycomb. 
that was there uh, for centuries as considered the, you know, the way the Vortiverse was. Now, over the centuries after that, archaeologists have found older codexes, older versions of that same book that shows not that verse there. So it's pretty clear scholarly-wise that it was an addition that happened somewhere along the third or fourth century in some of the manuscripts. And remember, the way scripture was transmitted was by scribes that would take the document that had been written in Greek and they would copy it. And that's how every scriptural, you know, that we didn't, before printing press, that's how scripture was passed on. And so that's why once in a while, if you look in your annotated Bible, you will see a reference to a variant uh, in the text because some versions uh, have a word differently or a phrase differently or something added. So by, probably, some, more often than not, it's an omission. You know, a scribe sees the cat ate the skunk and they look back and they forget the cat so they just say the skunk because your eyes are going back. Omissions happen more often in, in translation. But occasionally, a scribe will make a note on the margin Maybe this is like Cunnicle, and then that gets translated eventually in the, in, the, in the next version, that gets inserted in the text, and so for a while, it exists. Uh, when you find older versions and they're consistent, you say, well, that was probably an addition. Maybe interesting, but what I think is interesting is imagining something we'll never know, why somewhere along the way this notion of honeycomb, which was not the experience, obviously, of the earliest disciples, because it wasn't written, and it's not mentioned anywhere else. But when I, my imagination was saying, what would honey, why would it have been useful when Jesus ate fish after, to show that he wasn't a ghost, that he also ate honey? Now, this is purely my notion. I have not seen it anywhere else that anybody else has ever written this. But the first thing that I go to when I think of why they might add to that is the manna in the wilderness. Remember, after the children of Israel had gone into the wilderness, escaped Pharaoh, they were hungry and they begged for food and God rained down from them this bread-like substance, tasted like coriander seed and in the scripture, and sweet like honey. So in my mind, I'm thinking, the third, fourth century of the church, as the church is beginning uh, to, to, to move out into the world, uh, they were trying, maybe when they added this verse, to connect the experience of the disciples who had had a, the last meal, Jesus broke bread before he died, died, was resurrected. He had also broken bread uh, with the folks on the way to Emmaus. That's also in this, in this chapter. But the fact that it was connecting the formative experience with the Israelites being trusting in God, that, they would, that he would feed them with manna from heaven, and trusting that Jesus had ra has been raised from the dead and in fact is now destroyed death may have been a reason that that passage briefly was, uh, for some hundreds of years, was at least in one translation of scripture. I don't know. But what I do know is that if we can open the eyes of our faith, if we can really grasp the notion that Jesus has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, as we say. For since by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. If you can live into that belief that God transcends even all human foibles or sin or mistakes, and that invites us as the baptized into a connected relationship, not just with one another, but with Christians in all times and in all places, connected to Jesus, at our very center. Doesn't that change our perspective about a lot of the things that we do in this world? Doesn't it invite us to really live into that mystery that can you honestly grasp that this life is not all there is? And that what we are living for is truly to reflect the ministry of Jesus, the feeding of Jesus. And what does Jesus do most visibly, he feasts. He feeds us with the bread and the wine of the Eucharist this very day. The, he fed, he ate fish, he banqueted with his disciples. And this sense of what we are called to do and to be if we accept and believe that God lives in us and through us is to feed spiritually and physically the world in which we find ourselves. And if we can hold that as our center, Whatever we believe about climate change or everything else kind of 
falls away. And we understand that as individuals and as a corporate body, our role is with ever, whatever skill, whatever faith, whatever hope, whatever discipline we have, is to be the feeders of the faith and the hunger of the world in which we live. Let him be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and for the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for you, Holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name be glorified We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for Mother Jean Mead, Bill College, brother of Mimi O'Leary, and for all those who have asked for our prayers. We give thanks for this gathering this morning and for all of our guests who are worshiping with us. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion upon the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all persons may serve you in harmony 
around your heavenly throne through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Uh, Mother Gigi is away today, but Canon Roberts will be in the chapel to anoint and offer prayers of healing during the administration of communion. So if you would like to receive healing prayers, just please, after you receive uh, communion, just proceed uh, right into the chapel and he will be there waiting for you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, but chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. Give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, Philander Chase, 
Francis Godet, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. May God, who has brought us out of bondage into sin, into free and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your inher eternal inheritance and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Please be seated. My great joy to welcome you to Christ Church Cathedral this day. Those here joining us in the cathedral proper and those joining us via uh, our, our live stream or our later recorded broadcast, we're pre pleased that you've always, all of worship with us. Hope you can come, if you're here in the church, to coffee hour just down the hallway for some refreshments and conversation following the service. If you're visiting and you're perhaps looking for a church home, there should be a little card in the pew in front of you and with a pen that you could fill out and leave with one of us, the ushers or greeters, so we can follow up with you more about that. And uh, besides coffee hour, our theologian in residence, uh, Dr. Lowry, will be uh, offering a class starting at about 11.30 or so, just across from the parish hall in the Dean's Parlor, to which everyone is invited, uh, talking more about resurrection appearances of Jesus. So he may have more to add about the whole honeycomb thing. I don't know. He's an expert in all this kind of stuff. So please come, go if you'd like to spend some time talking about in more depth about those resurrection experiences. Uh, there, there is Ascension Day coming up 40 days after Easter. It is this year the 9th of May. It's always on a Thursday. Uh, we will be having an even, a choral even song, 6 p.m., right? 6 p.m. here in the, the car might not know this yet. Surprise! Lovely traditional Anglican service of of, of psalmody and chanting with the choir. So 6 p.m. there'll be a reception afterwards. Put that on your calendar for May the 9th. Today though, even sooner, at 3 o'clock this afternoon, there is a piano recital, piano recital in the cathedral here. Details are in the bulletin, but uh, if you'd like to come back for that, you're more than welcome. And a distant warning that our annual picnic uh, this year, spring picnic, will take place on Trinity Sunday, which is the Sunday that I can't read my own writing of Memorial Day weekend, the 21st. Catherine's, anyway, it's the it's Memorial Day weekend Sunday. It's time ahead. It'll be advertised, but just you know, have that in your mind that we have our end of the year picnic coming up then. Any birthdays or anniversaries for to be prayed for? Pray, nice, Father, Son, birthday week, huh? <laughs> Almighty God, pour out your grace upon these, your servants, as they prepare to celebrate the culmination of another year of life and prepare to begin yet another day and year in your service. Surround them with your blessing. Let them know day by day the abiding strength of your love in their life and let them be continually your servants in the world. Through your holy name we pray. Amen. In 182.